Yeah, thank you everybody for turning up to listen to us. Today I'm looking at basically, as the title says, reimagining the road to Cypriot independence. And what I want to do is, is a few things. Basically, I want to, in a way, tear down the myth of Archbishop Makarios that he was the father of Cypriot independence. I'm not going to suggest that somebody else was the father of Cypriot independence. I just want to tear that myth down uh, by showing a few things. One is that he never intended for independence to be the permanent solution in Cyprus. He always wanted to keep the door open for Enosis, and he was very careful about saying that when he apparently did the switch from Enosis to independence in September of 1958. And the second thing I want to do is introduce a fellow from London who was proposing independence even before EOKA had uh, began its activities in Cyprus in April of 55 in uh, pursuit of Enosis with Greece. And when he made his switch, Makarios did so by using this lady here, Barbara Castle, who was the uh, president of the, or whatever the title was, of the British Labour Party at the time. She went to Athens and um, helped him draft what became the infamous um, changing from Enosis to independence. And in the next image, that is Makarios with Sir Hugh Foote, the last governor of Cyprus, signing the independence agreements. So in Greek Cypriot literature, Makarios is basically, you know, a sort of legend, a cult figure. Um, and basically this quote there from Vanesis, who actually was the high commissioner of Cyprus to Australia in the 80s. He says, um, you know, quite representatively, I would say, um, Makarios showed himself quite capable of seizing the right moment to exercise his political gifts. In September of 58, he made perhaps his most significant political move up to date. He unequivocally shifted emphasis from Enosis to independence, which enabled the British, Greek and Turkish governments to begin the uphill task of resolving the Cyprus tangle. Now, this view is a hostage to the official Greek Cypriot history that elevates Makarios to a sort of cult hero status. Greek historiography doesn't do that exactly. There is a little less um, cult hero worship for Makarios um, because it had supported independence before him and was surprised when he had made the shift um, when he had. The problem is that Makarios never intended for independence to be the permanent status for Cyprus, keeping the door open to return to Enosis through UN support, which he attempted to do in 1963, which led to the civil war with the Turkish Cypriots in December of 63. What's interesting is that having published so much on Cyprus, I didn't know this until I started this little project, right? This little bit, this little sort of uh, bit added to that sort of statement. Um, and independence was, was proposed by others, as I will show you from 1954. And here is a list of those people. Krishna Menon, uh, the Indian permanent UN representative at the UN from 54 to 58. Evangelos Averov, the Greek foreign minister from February of 57, though he too always emphasized, at least privately, that he would keep, that the door for Enosis would always be open. Um, John Foster Dulles also supported independence. He was Secretary of State. Paul Henry Spark, the NATO uh, Secretary General from uh, May of 57, uh, supports independence. Uh, Charles Foley, a journalist in Cyprus who was heavily involved in Cypriot affairs, edited Grievous's memoirs. Grievous was the leader of Elka. And the person I'm going to introduce you to, an unknown figure, a private citizen, really, um, Jason Lukiano, uh, a prominent London Cypriot. Here are some photos of Krishna Menon. Evangelos Averov is this fellow here. And this fellow is Dimitrios Pitsios, who was the head of the Cyprus desk in the Greek Foreign Ministry. And this is Jason Lukianou, uh, nice looking man, I think, uh, somebody with a trusting face, uh, I think. Okay, so I want to produce a timeline from the first proposal of independence to Makarios. That takes us actually back to 1912. I'll do that briefly, though. Um, and then emphasize that Makarios only proposed independence as a temporary measure, shelving Enosis after years of opposing independence and swearing an oath to join Eoka, you had to swear an oath, right, that you would die for Enosis. Um, and then, and also explore the role of Lukianu, who first proposed independence in March of 54 and consistently advised Makarios to adopt his proposals, which turned out, in my view, to be in some ways quite similar to the Zurich London Accords, which, um, which formed the uh, independent Cyprus, the Republic. 
So what theories are informing me? Well, decolonization is one. Um, in Cyprus, we see, you know, you know, it, it seems that neither, you know, the colonizer or the colonized wanted independence, as I'll show you, um, except for Lukianu is one of those exceptions. One thing I haven't grappled with is thinking about the role of the diaspora here, because Lukianu is a diaspora Cypriot in London. Most of the Cypriots migrated to London. Australia was a secondary destination. It's, in, it's the reverse for Maltese, where um, they came primarily to Australia. Independence proposals. The first that I've ever come across was uh, a guy called Christodoulos Sozos, who was the mayor of Limassol in 1912, member of the legislature, first suggests independence as a stepping stone to Enosis, which is exactly how Makarios put it, so to speak, in 1958. Talk about being a few generations late, right? Uh, he was branded a traitor. I'm not sure if it uh, sort of pushed him to remedy that accusation because he died in the Balkan Wars fighting for Greece. In 1913, JCC Davidson, the private secretary of Louis Harcourt, the liberal secretary of state for the colonies, visited Cyprus and advised the British government back home that they should foster Cypriot ideals as opposed to Greek and Turkish with a view to creating a future Cypriot independent state. That, of course, never happened really. Um, Cyprus was offered to Greece in October of 1915, although it was rejected. It creates this expectation amongst those who want it for a repeat offer. In 1920s, the only party to ever support independence was the Communist Party of Cyprus um, in a Balkan Soviet uh, confederation or federation. <clears throat> in 1931, the nationalist, no, it was confederation, sorry, I'll correct myself. In 1931, the nationalists uh, led, a, led riots, uh, which included the communist leaders as part of an anti-imperialist revolt. This led to a British crackdown, the suspension of the constitution and so forth and so on. And then in 34, the far right assassinated Antonio Striandafilidis. Let me say probably assassinated uh, Antonio Striandafilidis as my book uh, that was mentioned last night for trying to work with the British to lay the foundations for a future Enosis, but on a different path. Because by now that the, the far right only wants Enosis and no constitution, no self-government, nothing, just to jump into Enosis and that's it. Whereas the Andafilidis thought, no, we need to take a, the British with us on this road and through self-government and do it properly. In 1942, AGEL, as it's known by its acronym, replaced the Communist Party and it made one very significant change. It ditched independence and took up Enosis as a platform. The only difference was that it argued that we need to have self-government first before we can get to Enosis. During World War II and the Greek Civil War, the Cypriot far right, um, uh, which was very close to the ex-organization or the he organization of George Grievous in Greece. And, and basically what happens is this is I suppose the catch cry, Ioannidis, Polygarpos Ioannidis, who is indeed linked to, I link him to the assassination of Triandafilidis, is a notorious um, far right wing journalist. He states, Enosis and only Enosis, until it is achieved, we prefer to be ruled by England. But we do not accept power in the hands of the people. Fascinating. It, this is what I would not term this as national liberation. It doesn't bring Turkish Cypriots on board. It doesn't bring other Cypriots who are not entirely behind Enosis either. In 1949, Agel does something that I think is unthinkable. It then it, it, it ditches self-government and adopts itself also the Enosis and only Enosis policy. This is my front cover. You saw it last night. Makarios in 54, this is interesting too, when Churchill's government announced in 54 that it wanted a new constitution for Cyprus, it didn't have a constitution right since 1931. Makarios replied to the Secretary of State that he was, and I quote, strongly protesting, let's be clear, he's protesting a constitution that's going to give them rights, protesting against the application in our island of such a policy, and we are declaring once more categorically that the Cypriot people will never cease to aspire with all its strength and according to the principles of justice and self-determination of peoples to its national liberation through its union with Mother Greece. Um, so Greek Cypriot elites limited the, what they believed national liberation was to immediate enosis. Lukianu, well, Lukianu, I'll try to go quickly through his bio. He, 
He was born in Yalusa, which is in the Panhandle. He arrived in London in 32. He studied, but probably didn't, I don't, I don't know if he finished it, but he got into the restaurants. And then he eventually starts up a coffee import business. In 1935, he joined the St. Barnabas Cypriot Brotherhood. And in 36, he joined what was called the Cypriot Eponymists, who were aligned with the Communist Party in Cyprus that was at the time supporting independence. That's why they were known as Cypriot Eponymists. But he wasn't a communist. He was a liberal. I don't know exactly when he began to be very close to the Liberal Party, but by the 50s, he's close. He, he knows Davis, the leader, or Davies. In World War II, um, the British monitored him because he opposed conscription. So they begin to not like him too much and he, because he advised Cypriots how to get out of it, how to get out of serving. He did also work for the Greek consulate in Cardiff. In 53, 54, he is the president of the Brotherhood. <clears throat> he challenges, he's challenged, however, by the right-wing pro-Enosis speakers such as Spiros Kiprianou, who happens to later on become a future foreign minister and president of Cyprus. We take over the Brotherhood. That's Kipriano behind Makaria. So I think it's a very telling photo. Uh, happy, to, happy to talk about it later. Um, not surprised that I found this photo. Um, Lukianos's independence proposals are first made in the Observer on the 21st of March. He argues that after five years of self-government, there should be a plebiscite and the people should decide between Enosis and independence. This angers Kipriano who ran the Ethnarchy office. The Ethnarchy office was linked, of course, back to Makarios, our uh, pro-Enosis. He replies that the Cypriots only want Enosis and only Enosis, promptly makes a move on the Brotherhood, and he eventually takes over, and it becomes an arm of the Ethnarchy, basically. And Makarios contributes funds uh, to achieving this. There's a long story behind it. We don't go through into it now. Lukianus, the Lukianu then makes further proposals in September of 57. In July of 56, with Makarios exiled to the Seychelles, Lukianu visits the colonial office and suggests an alternative to Enosis, probably self-government followed by independence. The British suggest partition in December of 56. This is a very important point, but I can't go into it any further. When I mean partition, I mean between Greece and Turkey, right? In May and June, Makarios makes an offer of self-government followed by, the, by a plebiscite to decide on Enosis or independence. That is the first ever time he has made a concession to allow a vote on independence as well as Enosis. Lukianu at the time was in Athens. We know that because he was honeymooning uh, with his wife. In September, of, and, and states in other areas that he did catch up with Makarios there. Maybe he planted the seed. I don't know that for sure. In September of 57, Lukianu sends a colonial officer plan to create the free state guaranteed by international treaty. And that's the key similarity <clears throat> between the final agreements that when Cyprus is created as an independent republic, it is guaranteed by international treaty. Slightly different to what Lukianu proposed, but nonetheless the same principles. He wants to heal the wounds, to foster conciliation and find constructive and, la and a lasting solution. He's not interested in Enosis. For him, independence is the lasting solution. There are three stages in his plan. Last, the first last eight years, which would be a self-government, bringing the Greek and Turkish Cypriots into a power-sharing arrangement. Second party is Cyprus, Greece, and Turkey would sign different treaties of association, and Cyprus and the UK would sign a treaty of defense, all for fixed periods of time, or similar, not identical, but similar to the final arrangements that were eventually made. Third part of it is that the UK, the UK would declare the independence of a free state of Cyprus, and after three months, there would be a referendum to decide if Cyprus joined the Commonwealth. And as I say below there, the treaties of association and defence are similar to the treaties of alliance and guarantee signed in 59 as part of the Zurich London Accords. The reactions, well, in Greece, Averov proposes independence in 57 to end the conflict and allow for a future return to Enosis when the situation allows. The UK monitors Lukianu, believing that he meant well and had many silent supporters, but lacked organization and was up against the loud voice of the pro eoka mob. The Cypriot government claimed that independence would lead to the Greek Cypriot demographic majority dominating the Turkish Cypriot minority, demographic minority, and would lead to conflict, conflict, and that it was rather problematic. So they're against it too. Then in 58, Macmillan, the prime minister, tours Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus to sell his new plan, called the partnership plan. It would be a self-government shared between Greek and Turkish Cypriots involving official Greek and Turkish representatives before offering a tricondominium. 
I don't have time to go into, I'm happy to talk about that in the questions as a permanent solution. Turkey accepts, but Greece rejects, and the UK says, well, we'll go ahead with it, why not? Out of fear, Makarios decides to offer self-government, followed by independence with enosis, and taksim is the Turkish word for partition, uh, prohibited to stop Macmillan, Macmillan's plan, and save enosis for the future. Supported by the UK Labour Party, he hence invites Barbara Castle to Athens. I haven't grappled with the fact that Castle is a woman and he is an archbishop. There is something I think there to, to grapple with, but I haven't quite grappled with that. Uh, I, I can discuss this in questions, but this is the tri-condominium plan. Happy to discuss it because it's interesting if you are interested later. Look, Yanu's role in Athens. Well, Castle's mission helps Makarios to make the announcement, right? She's like a cog in that sort of communication strategy. But on the 16th of October, Lukianu briefs the colonial office with Makarios's consent. He visits them. He says that he had just been to Athens in August and September, and he had met Makarios many times. And it was there that Makarios agreed to accept guaranteed independence, so long as Enosis could still be possible in the future. So he acknowledges this, okay, even though he doesn't agree with that. Lugianu further convinces Makarios on self-government to be followed by independence, which would be guaranteed by a tripartite treaty. Makarios approves that Lugianu, uh, uh, you know, goes to the colonial office. This was identical to Lugianus's plan from the year before, from September of 57. This is a very bad, unfocused photo of Barbara Castle and Makarios in September of 58. This is the Greek Prime Minister Garamanlis, Zorlu, the Turkish Foreign Minister, the Turkish Prime Minister Adnan Menderes. Both of them ended up, both of them perished in the coup, didn't they? In, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's Averov here. In, uh, this is from January 59 when they signed the Zurich Accords and then they went off to London to sign the London side of it. This is Makarios meeting Lukianu in 1970. We think it's in London. Not 100%, the family's not 100%, but very interesting meeting nonetheless, um, I think. Conclusion, British decolonization of Cyprus was far from being controlled by the colonizer or the colonized, given the roles of Greece and Turkey, firstly, but also that of Jason Lukianu. Although it cannot be said that Lukianu was the father of Cypriot independence, we cannot say, I think, that Makarios was either, given that he didn't accept independence as a permanent solution and revisited Enosis, which caused the um, civil war in December of 63. London was reluctant to support Lukianu's proposals, partly because it was skeptical about independence and only acquiesced once they realized that they could get out without losing face and their sovereign bases would secure their strategic interests, which is also connected to the tricondominium plan. British warnings about independence, however, proved prophetic as the Makarios government, in an effort to pursue Enosis again, tried to show that independence was unworkable for most of the life of the nascent republic, those three years, proposed constitutional changes to reduce the Turkish Cypriot rights, which were really protections because they were a demographic minority, and led to the Christmas clashes of December of 63. Thank you so much for listening. Well, 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 well.